So I am going to be very brief because I am eager to hear the other talks um, before I have to uh, run off to a Zoom call. Uh, my name is Andrea Stevenson Wan, and I'm going to, um, I am a 50-ish uh, white woman wearing a pretty patterned shirt that has leopards on it. Um, and I am mentioning that because this is um, an example of thinking about how to present social cues in different ways it allows me to tell you all about that. Um, and which most people wouldn't necessarily notice even if they were in person and I feel much happier now that you all know about the leopards on my shirt. Um, so I'm going to um, talk about, if we can go to the next slide. Um, I'm. Oh, okay, yes, I will go to the next slide. I will not go to the next slide. So what I want to quickly talk about um, is accessibility as a guide for equity, equity and sustainability in virtual conferences. Of course, we know um, accessibility um, is an equity uh, uh, component. This is my second time coming to XR Access, and I have really appreciated sort of the community spirit and, and um, thinking and addressing about addressing these issues. Um, so I wanted this presentation to be um, sort of an instigator for more conversations uh, around this. Um, perhaps on Slack and Zoom. So why should we do anything in virtual reality, right? Um, so this is um, something that came up during break when we were uh, talking about what might be the one of the fundamental errors of virtual reality, which is the idea that it should be a one-to-one -one mapping of our experience in the physical world. And I really appreciated Atia's last presentation where um, she talked about this, this joy that you can uh, get from having uh, an experience that is novel and is not a one-to-one -one mapping of your experience in the physical world. And this mirrors some of the other notes that I took when I was listening to the previous presentations, um, and I can't read my own handwriting very well, so I apologize, I'm not attributing these, but there was a quote, it's a virtual world, I should be able to lie down if I want to, right? Or uh, the expectation that this is not about trying to expand, um, that we should be trying to expand the um, range of experience and not just replicating um, the experiences that we already have. And then another really key quote um, to this was um, that sometimes with inaccessible experiences, the expectation is that the folks that need whatever accommodation would fix them. And so this community is particularly well equipped to think about how um, addressing uh, issues in virtual reality can enrich everyone's experience, but that is a community level uh, issue. Okay, so classically, when we think, why would we do anything in virtual reality? Um, if we would replicate things that were too rare, exp expensive, or dangerous to do in the physical world. Uh, but in fact, when we think about uh, what virtual reality can bring us, especially in the context of conferences, which we all have experience in it, obviously. We can think about how it can be more equitable, accessible, and in the context of conferences, particularly more sustainable than those that are uh, held exclusively in the physical world. Um, sustainability, um, as we're all aware, especially after that really uh, muggy, unpleasant uh, day yesterday, um, is a crucial issue for all of us, a, a burning issue, um, literally. Um, when we think about in-person con conferences, we think about um, the issues of the carbon costs of air travel and at conference waste, um, because we cannot necessarily conserve as we do at home. But um, more relevantly for this talk, there are also a number of inequities for in-person conference travel, travel, some of which um, we're, oops, um, some of which we're aware of. Um, my slides are getting a little, here we go. So just to name a few, and I think um, it would be good to continue to generate more of these in our conversations after this talk. Visa and citizenship issues bar a lot of people from traveling to different conference locations. Um, physical spaces are often in a 
um, and accessible travel can be extremely challenging, uh, both for reasons of distance or just for di the different constraints um, of everyone as individuals. Um, conferences are also very intense in their time requirements and their um, social demands, which can provide different challenges for different individuals. Um, and there are also financial constraints. Right, so we um, are we're fortunate to be able to gather together, uh, but we know that there are a lot of people who are not physically here for some of these reasons, right? And we miss these folks. So one goal would be to hold more of our conferences in virtual spaces and virtual reality is a particularly um, promising platform for this. So I have here, um, a copy of a tweet from Kent Bai, where, which I'll read, he says, wow, the IEEE VR 2020 conference just announced a venue change from Atlanta, Georgia to online and virtual reality for free. This is the first academic conference I've ever seen do this. If there's any community that can pull this off, it's IEEE VR. This was of course due to COVID concerns. That's how it started. So how it's going, well, okay, IEEE VR 2020 <laughs> will, um, boy, this, I'm very challenged by this clicker. Okay. Okay. So the next announcement was IEEE VR 2020 will be held in person. This will be our big in-person return to the event after the difficult years under the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay. So why are we not conferencing in, in um, virtual reality? We know why, because it's not um, accessible yet. And so what I want to quickly um, review is how the work that is, is currently being done on making virtual reality spaces accessible can also address some of the equity issues that happen in virtual conferences um, very broadly. Uh, so this is a um, some quotes from a recent paper that was should be out shortly in the um, Information Society looking at people's reviews of their experiences conferencing in virtual worlds. Um, and the, to be brief, um, we said that the current findings suggest that the media, for instance, of social VR could be, can be more conducive to synergistic interactions, to good interactions than just video conferencing or Zoom. But all of our results emphasize that people need agency in their media choice. Um, and they need to use, be able to use that agency to overcome their individual constraints in the virtual worlds. And those tools don't um, completely exist. Um, so to close, um, and here is a review from another uh, relatively recent paper where uh, people specifically identified accessibility as a potentially major strength of conferences. It allows people with caregiving responsibilities or other um, uh, who can't easily leave their home or people who have difficulty traveling to attend these conferences, but there's a lack of tactile learning. Um, communication is more constrained because the social cues um, are only through a few channels. Um, and so it's this, this opportunity that's really um, being um, not yet fully taken advantage of. So waiting for the slide lag, how can these be addressed? Um, these are some initial groupings that I've actually been continuing to revise through the conference. Um, but a short list of the inequities of virtual conferences, many of which have already been discussed today. So financial, even if you're connecting virtually, the hardware can be very expensive, um, as well as being inaccessible. There are disparities in infrastructure. Not everybody has the robust Wi-Fi, for example, to support uh, connecting in immersive virtual reality. Time zone differences will remain an issue, right? So if, the, if you're in Singapore right now, attending the conference is difficult. And there's a tiered attendance, which I think uh, hopefully the participants who are on Zoom right now are experiencing less of it because um, Dylan and others have been conscientious about pulling people in the conferences, but I bet many of you have had the experience of trying to attend a hybrid um, conference and fe feeling very much as though you weren't fully present, you weren't really able to participate, and you weren't having the social um, interaction that you might have if you were able to be in person. Um, but um, this is also um, as something that is an opportunity because uh, people may also feel in a physical conference that um, if they are not a prominent figure, 
um, if they are not very extroverted, if they don't feel confident about reading social cues, that, um, that there can also be a tiered system in um, in-person conferences. So um, people may also be uh, distracted by what's happening in their environment. They may not have or um, be able to sustain an immersed experience. Virtual spaces can also be very inaccessible and exhausting. Um, and there are a number of issues with self-representation um, in virtual spaces. So if we roughly group um, these, uh, how a flexibility and, a, and allowing individual agency could help address these problems I've highlighted. So platform flexibility, which is something that's been discussed in this group, the idea that you should be able to connect from multiple devices using multiple modalities, and you should be able to select your level of immersion and your uh, and how your movements are tracked and represented. Um, this could address um, some financial and infrastructure dis disparities, as well as accommodating uh, people's uh, preferences for um, embodiment. So my slide's not totally updated. And temporal flexibility, which, which is something that um, is been particularly highlighted um, in this community uh, is the idea that it's important to allow people to um, access and to at content and to interact at their own pace so that people can um, preserve their energy. So this can also help address time zone differences and people who have obligations in their physical space um, by providing the opportunity to uh, allow uh, spaces to rest and filter experiences and to um, control the pace at what you're receiving and generating content. And then finally, the idea of social flexibility. So some of the uh, work that's, um, that's my personal favorite at this um, conference um, and in this area is the idea that we should be able to socialize in multiple modalities and render and represent our social cues in multiple channels because we don't all um, like to present or are able to um, follow social cues if they're presented in uh, the typical way that um, in the uh, physical world. So by uh, promoting the ability to customize your um, avatar so you can represent aspects of your identity that you cannot perhaps do in the physical world um, can allow us to foster more um, equitable social connections and um, and build everybody's ability to um, to read and to receive social cues in a way that would broadly improve the conference experience. And so the aim is um, that th that could be accessible to the public extremely broadly. Um, so an issue in um, uh, conferencing in general is that that one of the good things that came across from some of the virtual conferences is that it allowed people to make connections that they didn't make in phys physical conferences because it opened up the space in a way that allowed people to, um, to attend who wouldn't normally attend conferences and to um, interact socially and approach each other in ways that they might not have felt comfortable doing in the physical world. So I think the opportunities um, for accessible virtual platforms could be make not just um, make conferences more equitable, uh, but make them better uh, for everyone in ways that they are currently not. So I think half the people um, in the room are people who have worked on projects related to this topic. So I didn't, do not have a list of names, but in particular, um, the team um, led by um, Shiri Azenkot that the for the making social virtual reality accessible to blind and low vision people. Also, uh, uh, thanks to Meta for an, a related project and making social virtual reality accessible and for, on the self-presentation of disability in virtual reality. And I probably wasn't as short as I meant to be, but um, I look forward to continuing this conversation in the future. That's right. Andrew, hold on, hold on. Don't run away. We got uh, a little time for Q&A. Um, Thank you, thank you for this. I'd, I'd love, love to, to hear, hear everybody else's talk too. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll 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 have a few minutes into lunch, but people, I will have that much patience. I trust. Um, we have a question in the front, and then I'd love to also uh, hear any comments from people on Zoom because uh, I'm sure there there must be a couple on this. 
Yeah, it's great. I keep hearing about accessibility in the virtual space, and I spend half my day in Zoom and Google Meets, and I give them a lot of credit for their keyboard commands as somebody who's blind. I mean, it's very useful. I get to know everybody's preferred pronouns, but as soon as somebody starts a screen share or starts to talk about something that's on the screen, completely inaccessible. I know this isn't your job, but do you know if any work is being done to make these screen shares accessible to people who can't see them? There, well, this, there was, so this was something that came up under the topic of the Convergence Accelerator Grant. So I feel like I might turn that question over to um, Sherry and Dylan, who I know this was something that we have been exploring. And I'm not sure who else is here. Um, I know uh, we had our, our colleague Charles Lapierre at Benetech who's working a lot on that very specific problem. Yeah. Um, I think for on our side, the project was uh, kind of half exactly that, you know, screen sharing or what, what are you presenting? Um, and then kind of our half of it was all the social cues that it's it might be hard to pick up on. Yeah, but, um, the, but the content issue is mm -hmm. huge. It's just that I was not, you're right, personally addressing yeah. that. Yeah, I, I think we've heard from, and I, I believe Microsoft at their latest tech uh, outing was showing something along the lines of kind of having the the actual content be shared and not just the video. Um, but it's definitely something that, that could use a lot more work for sure. Thank you. Zoom question? Yeah. Do you have any insights about existing platforms and their integration of VR, especially the differences between ones like Zoom versus ones that have more native support for VR? I feel like it's such a, a shifty landscape. So as a question, I'm looking at Kevin, but is a question um, what platforms might be most promising for uh, accessibility. I think Hubs was doing some great things. They don't exist anymore. So I feel like it's such a fluid area um, that I don't have a recommendation if that's what's being requested. I feel like a lot of the interesting work is being prototyped currently. Yeah, yeah, I know there's there's two steps forward, one step back in terms of like alt space, had some work with captions, but then I don't think they ever made them mainstream to all the work and then alt space closed down. Yeah, the churn's rough. Um, spatial, uh, I think at one point was charging as for like captions as a special feature for when you to talk, it would appear above your head. And charging for accessibility features is never a good idea. <laughs> uh, I think they've changed that since then. Um, but yeah, there's follow ups on that Zoom. We can take them. I think we can take one or two more questions here. But Dylan, I have to I have to go to my Zoom call. You do have your five, and I want to hear everybody else's talk. So a dissertation defense to get to as well. Yes. All right. In that case, uh, thank you, Andrea, very much. Um, we'll go ahead and bring up our next speakers, uh, Nicole and Aaron for Meta.